The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, You will conceive in your womb and bear a child, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. As we approach very quickly Christmas, this fourth Sunday of Advent, Advent reminds us that Christmas is just around the corner this week. And as we're reflecting about this gospel, which we hear frequently, particularly in Marian feasts, is to put it in a perspective of how Matthew Kelly does it. You know Matthew Kelly, right? Matthew Kelly, remember we gave you the Master a couple years ago? You were to write on there something that kind of struck you, whether it was a phrase in a song or in one of the prayers and one of those things. It's, it's kind of a neat way to do Mass because you can always get something out of Mass. Everyone concentrates on the homily. It's only ten minutes and you're not going to get so much out of it if you don't include the whole rest of the Mass. So we're going to look at it a little different way today because this account is very popular. If you noticed our opening collect, we'll start with that. We beseech you, O Lord, right? Put grace in our hearts that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of his angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. You know this prayer, don't you? Yes, everybody knows this prayer because it's the Angelus prayer, right? Remember that? You've prayed the Angelus before, I'm sure. Huh, what was our gospel today? The Angelus. You didn't quite catch that. Notice how they match. The prayer for the Mass for this Sunday is the same as the gospel and the prayer that we use. The angel of the Lord appeared unto Mary. And the same thing, right? It all kind of matches up. Kind of fun. Oh, yeah, that's where we get all that stuff. Oh, it's from Mass, and it leads taken from Mass to lead back to Mass. So it's it's very beautiful how the devotional life of the church is meant to bolster the Mass through the actual prayers that we say 
at Mass. So that might be a hint. Oh, gee, that was pretty interesting. See how those connections can be made when we listen to all the other things in Mass. But I'm going to say a phrase from our preface today. The preface is from September, or December 17th through Christmas Eve is there's a proper preface. In other words, one we have to say every day. And there's a line in it. And Mary longed for the coming of this Messiah with the love beyond all telling. Huh. Isn't that an interesting line? Mary longed for the Savior with a love beyond all telling. You'll hear me say, I might not have it precisely right, but that's basically it. We should talk about that. It's very beautiful. Because we celebrated a few weeks ago the Immaculate Conception. A couple weeks ago, the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She was conceived without sin. Her parents, Anna and Joachim, were blessed by God to have their daughter be removed of the original sin at the moment of her conception. The full weight and power of Christ's cross and resurrection was given beforehand to her to conceive Christ. Grace is outside of time, not in time. So this grace was applied to Mary so that she could be conceived without sin. That's the first thing that we reflect on. Oh, the love of God and the plan of God is to conceive a worthy mother for the Son of God, to become incarnate. Today we read the account. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Wow. Mary, full of grace. How did she get there? How do we go from this moment, from her immaculate conception? Well, there's a tradition has a beautiful in-between feast, which is the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This tradition holds that when Mary became of age, as, uh, of her age of reason, that she decided that she would consecrate herself to pray for the coming of the Messiah. Right? She dedicated herself her, to be a virgin to pray for the coming of the Messiah. That's what tradition holds. Indeed, in Jerusalem there is a church where, again, where tradition holds there was a convent of Jewish women praying for the coming of the Messiah. Not unprecedented in the history of that time. If you remember your Roman history, if you've been to Rome, there's the temple where the festival virgins lived. And once a year, if you didn't remote, they could tell the, the emperor to do whatever they wanted him to do. They had power over the emperor because they were consecrated to pray for the gods for the emperor. It was pagan, but indeed very interesting tradition in the, the ancient world that spread throughout. Those types of things happened, and no different in Jerusalem amongst the Jewish people. Because... If you look at the scripture, it's kind of fun to go and look at the history of all of the prophecies of Christ, the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament. And surely Mary, when she was a child beginning to go to synagogue, they read these passages from the scrolls, right? And at the time... It's an oral culture, not a, a written culture. We're much more written. Right? We can't recall what people say very well, right? They do studies on that. You know, do people hear like they used to a couple hundred years ago? Well, no. You go back to, because we rely on the written word, because we all read now. So we rely less on our ears and more on our eyes. It's just a fact, and Frankly, it's easier, right? Don't you think? <laughs> Who likes to memorize? Not I. Right? Kids, I had to memorize my multiplication table. Ah! Right. So we know how to memorize. But 
in the ancient, no, you, you heard things and you repeated them and they don't change. Very interesting, when they do studies of ancient cultures and the passing of oral tradition, it doesn't change. You can see generations, they've done it. Generation to generation, did, the cha- did it ever change? Uh, no. It never changed. The words would remain the same. And so Mary would hear these words. And we also know in the scripture that she always treasured the word of God and she contemplated them in her heart. She always heard the word of God and reflected upon it. So she must have, obviously, heard a lot. So we'll start with the book of Genesis, the Proto-Evangelium. That's Genesis 3.15. It's a scripture passage that we even have a name for. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, While you strike at her heel, she will crush your head. I never see a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? Mary's standing on the snake's head, crushing it. Right? Always, the favorite one is the, uh, the, my favorite one is that Satan has an apple in his mouth to remind us of the fall of the apple. Boom. So, first prophecy. And if you go through, Moses, you know, uh, are you the prophet? They would say, well, this is the prophet that Moses predicted. You, God will raise up a prophet after me. We read one today. David is going to build a house for God. Nathan says, no, you shed too much blood, but I will give you a greater promise. Your throne will endure forever. Right? His throne was split between his sons, so... Obviously, it wasn't a terrestrial kingdom that we're referring to because his son split. Solomon and Rehoboam didn't get along very well. Split the kingdom between Judah and Israel. Remember that terrible scene and they're still apart. Samaritans and the Jews. But the kingdom would go to the son of David. In great pains, we have in the Gospel of St. Matthew the genealogy of Joseph, which is back to David. But the virgin must have reflected on that and prayed about that. Oh my, this is the Messiah, please come. And you look at all the prophecies in the prophetic books, such as Isaiah, longing for the coming of the Messiah when we will be delivered, right? All those promises we've read. So you think about that. Do we long for the coming of the Messiah as the Virgin did? That longing with love beyond all telling produced hail full of grace. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever because he has the throne of David, his father. The fulfillment of all those prophecies. She questions. I have not known man. I'm betrothed to be married, but I'm not married. The angel says, no, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And the power of the Most High will come upon you and you will conceive the Son this way and he will be holy and separate, set aside for his mission to save God's people. And the example to give him, to give a reassurance, your cousin Elizabeth who was supposed to be not able to have a child is now in her sixth month. She who was barren is now bearing a child. And we know what happens immediately after this scene that she makes runs in haste to Elizabeth to assist her. And indeed, this moment it's very beautiful if you see the Office of Readings today. One of the very famous readings, meditations about between this line and Mary said. Whole nice meditation from Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. Beautiful, I'd recommend it if you have a 
app for that, for the Office of Readings today, this meditation by St. Bernard, which says she didn't know what to say. And so he thinks about that. Well, all of the prophets are begging you to say yes. All of the patriarchs are begging you to say yes. Adam and Eve are begging you to say yes. So you have this chorus of people who are praying that she will say yes. It's very beautiful. And these moments, well, if she were to say no, and the appointment would go away, no, she would seek again God. No, she would not say no, because she knows it is the will of God for her. And very beautifully he ends, Fiat Miki Secundum Verbum Tu. Behold, let it be done unto me according to thy word. Very beautiful. Mary, who had longed for the coming of Christ with a love beyond all telling, then opens her heart. And as the saints always say, she conceived our Lord Jesus in her heart before she conceived in her womb through faith. She conferred Christ. Which gives us pause for ourselves. Do we long for the coming of the Messiah with love beyond all telling? Over the days, do we desire that? Do we have the desire for God to be made manifest in our lives to come? Do we open our hearts in faith to receive the Savior as the Virgin did? She who is full of grace gives her grace to us. Grace is not something that's withheld, generally not asked for. We ask for those graces because we tend not to ask for them. We're a bit shy. No, we should be bold and ask God to open our hearts to receive the Savior that the we get a longing for the coming of the Messiah in our own lives, the coming of Christ in this fullness of grace to us, because it's available to us. So in these closing days of Advent, let us open our hearts to receive the Savior. Open our hearts in faith to let the Holy Spirit come upon us and overshadow us with a desire and longing for the coming of the Messiah with a love beyond all telling. God bless you.